of our Trinity, Trinity Inc. Um, lunchtime series. Um, the title of the talk is Do We Really Know Who Our Students Are? Understanding, Implementing and Embedding a Culturally Responsive Pedagogy in Our Everyday Practice. And um, Dr. Animal, Aminal Hock is going to address this today. And we're also going to be, um, our, our two of our student partners are also going to be um, talking to us as well. So I'm just going to hand over um, for, to our Associate Vice Provost for EDI, Professor Lorraine Leeson, who's just going to say a few words um, before we get going. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and happy Friday. I am delighted to be here at this session. Um, I was saying to um, our colleagues there just a few moments ago that even, even before I had the kind invitation to say something, I had already registered for this session because I just think that what Aminal has to say promises to be extremely interesting, relevant, and useful. So I very much look forward to being here. And I am so grateful to our wonderful Trinity Inclusive curriculum colleagues, student partners uh, and staff colleagues who have engaged in the project for their commitment to bringing this forward. So thank you for organizing this webinar series, um, everybody involved, because this of course is our kickoff moment. And this is the first of what promises to be a really wonderful, exciting, challenging and inspiring series of webinars. And I say that before going on to say, and I will be actually appearing in one of them, but that has nothing to do with me and everything to do with the fact that the people from external to Trinity will be partnered with people from internal to Trinity so that we can take um, their ideas, their insights, their suggestions, and then through like today, our student partners, and then sometimes through to staff and colleagues here in, in college, that we can say, well, how does that apply to us? And how can we how can we work our way through some of those ideas and think about how we integrate them into our own practice? So without any further ado, oh, actually, I should say one more thing. Make sure you register for next month, because next month um, we will have Dr. Ross Woods, who is the senior manager in the higher education at Authorities Centre for Excellence for Equality, Diversion and Include. Did I say diversion? Diversity and Inclusion joining us. And uh, I'll be delighted to engage in a conversation with him and keep an eye on the Trinity Inc. website and social media for more information on that. As I said, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and I very much look forward to what Dr. Aminal Hawk has to tell us and to the conversation that follows. So back to you, Rachel. Thanks so much. Thanks Amelia Lorraine. Um, so just to give you a bit of a bio of Aminal, I've known Aminal since um, 2016 when he came and spoke at a conference we were organising about migrant young people, um, which proved to be an absolute hit. So we've kept in touch ever since and have, have discussed working on various projects. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure it will in the future. Um, so Aminal is currently a lecturer in the Educational Studies Department of Goldsmiths in the University of London. He gained his doctorate from Goldsmiths in 2011 and his in-depth eth ethnographic research for it forms the basis of his book called British Islamic Identity, um, third generation Bangladeshis from East London, which was published in 2015. We, we did have a discussion just before you came on around his accent and how that would go down with, with the Irish. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see, it's, it's a very London accent. Um, Third generation, yeah, so published in 2015. Um, his writing and work focuses on issues of multicultural Britain, identity, social ju justice, youth policy, religion, cultural responsive, culturally responsive pedagogies and inclusive education, race relations and Islamic feminism. So he's a very busy man. He's some 29 years of voluntary and professional experience in the youth community and voluntary sector. In 2008, he was awarded an MBE for services to youth justice in East London. And in 2016, he was appointed as a trustee with the Royal Museum's um, Greenwich by the Prime Minister's office. Amina was born in Bangladesh. His family came to the UK when he was just three years old. He considers himself a British Bangladeshi and an East Londoner. He's the proud father of three girls, a keen footballer and a passionate Man United fan, although that's not going too well for him at the moment. So I'll hand you over to Aminal. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Rachel and Lorraine, for the very warm introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I should also say thank you to Trinity for initiating such an important um, discussion around EDI. And why, and we, especially now in the global context where we are seeing the, 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 the resurfacing of the ugly face of racism, discrimination, um, 
national nationality on the on, along the lines of racist identity, racialism. Dare I say, we're seeing some fascist ideology re-emerging, um, and and the whole Brexit narrative, and also importantly, the whole Black Lives Matters narrative. Um, it's it's becomes especially important that we continue on this discussion around why inclusivity, multicultural heritage, identity, and cultures are ever so important and should be embedded in our everyday life, not just in education, but within wider policy and everything that affects us on a daily basis. Um, and I'm really, I'm really delighted that Trinity are, are leading this discussion. Um, and I'm just trying to share my screen before I... Sorry about this, people. Can you guys see the, the, the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, we can. Um, right, so um, the other thing I should say is that the structure of today's discussion, I can't seem to share it for some reason. Sorry. It's there, it's there, Aminol, it's just coming up as the whole presentation. So can you can you see where you can click from current from from the beginning? There we go. Can you see that? Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> right. So the structure of today's talk, there's always a technical glitch. Um, the structure of today's talk, I wanted to um, first and foremost draw on my own ethnographic um, research around working with young Bangladeshis in particular from the east end of London. Um, I wanted to also draw upon the current work that we're doing at Goldsmiths with our, our very much our BAME um, student cohort and trying to really uncover some of their life and lived their life and lived experiences and make this and and to ensure that these experiences start governing the way we teach their, them and also generically I've been engaged in much anti-racist work with the National Education Union and I wanted to bring in some of that experience as well um, on on that there are some disclaimers that I think I should say right from the beginning there is much diversity and intersectionality, intersectionality of experiences. So when I talk about the BAME student experience, of course, I'm not speaking on behalf of all BAME students. Of course, I, I appreciate and I acknowledge that there is a diversity in experiences. You, we cannot generalize, you know, the, the experience of our student cohort is very different and it, much of it depends on, um, and two, two factors, I argue much of it depends on socio-economic status and background, and also whether the student is the first from their family to come to university. That seems to be a consistent, um, that seems to play a consistent bearing in this discussion. My arguments and observations are also um, based on my own empirical research and also my, my work um, as a youth and community worker, working with some of the most disadvantaged young people across Europe. So we're talking young people who are Who've, been, who've become part of the criminal justice system from a very young age, um, some refugee asylum seeking groups of young people, and also young people who, who live, who come from really disadvantaged, disadvantaged overcrowded um, socioeconomic backgrounds. And also as, a, as an anthropologist and as a sociologist, I, it's, it's important that I state that this discussion is a discussion, it's a debate. I don't, offer any solutions or answer to what is an ongoing dynamic complex conversation. But what, what I do want to do is offer some insight and understanding into some of these issues. Uh, so this is, this is gonna form another part of, of this conversation um, around, um, I'm gonna try and give you some insight, some introduction to some of the lived experiences that many of our students encounter and experience on a daily basis. One part of today's discussion is also going to focus on something that's affected all of us across the globe, um, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and how, how, the, how the experiences of these students has been exacerbated by, by the COVID um, experience. And towards the end, I just want to discuss and offer some practical ways that we at Goldsmith have, um, have some practical strategies that we have implemented in trying to counter and challenge some of these uh, wider narratives that are, that are acting as obstacles for many of our students on a daily basis. So some key questions for you to think about without necessarily having any answers to, for you to think about and ponder upon as I talk. Um, 
and th this these questions i guess underpin the the discussion around a culturally um, responsive pedagogy one question is do we really know who our students are and also do we and should we care about this question is it our job to know our students right or are we there just to teach or lecture or part knowledge um, do we should we see our students as just students or are they human is there is there something else going on about their lives that we should know about and if we know about that does it make our teaching and our experience and our relationship a richer experience for both of us the second question is are we aware of the wider social the social community cultural issues that many of our students experience on a daily basis so when they come in in through the lecture halls into our seminar rooms are we aware of the wider issues that they've been experiencing on a daily basis. And also the, the, the other question is, how can we get to know our students? We, we are increasingly overworked. We are restrained institutionally um, by um, deadlines. We all have our research um, duties. We all have our own lives and own families. Um, <clears throat> can we spend, do we have the time or the energy um, or even the inclination to get to know our students? and find out more about their views, their worldviews, their experiences and their aspirations. And if and when we do, can that inform our pedagogy in a very proactive and very informative way? So just to start off with, um, can we just, I wanna spend maybe a minute or so just trying to unpack this notion of a culturally sensitive, um, a culturally sensitive and a culturally responsive pedagogy. In light of neoliberal, and I, I argue this in one of the papers that I wrote a couple of years ago, I argue that in light of neoliberal reforms to education, there is a need to revert back to a more inclusive and collaborative form of education, where the line between the school and the community is blurred. Often there's a physical line, almost the, the school gates or the university gates that says to the rest of the world that we're exclusive. I argue that they need, that, that line needs to be blurred. As a teaching philosophy, a culturally responsive pedagogy is premised on the idea that value in culture is central to learning. If we value our students, if we respect them, and they get that feeling and that inclination that we as educators respect who they are, their identities, their backgrounds, their race, their lives, then that makes education more meaningful and a much more beneficial experiences. Such, such an approach, I argue, empowers students intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically. Now, these are not, these are not, this is not a new idea. This is not a new argument. Um, of course, the, I really love, like this, this, this phrase from um, the Bullock Report in 1975, uh, where, where, it is, where it is argued that students, pupils, and young, young people do not leave their social, cultural worlds and identities behind once they enter the school gates. And I put the, 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 the last bit in, and nor should they, right? Our students do not leave their social cultural experiences outside of the university gates. This is not a new idea. This, this, this idea of a culturally responsive pedagogy has been championed um, by um, educational philosophers such as Dewey, John Dewey, Paulo Ferrer, amongst many others, around the premise of humanity, dialogue, student-centered, pupil-centered. This is not a new idea, but it's, it's useful to remind ourselves as educators that such a pedagogy is really useful for our students. I wanted to start off maybe now with a, a, a short exercise and I want, I want the participants, you guys to get involved in this. So of course we have been either as students or as educators ourselves, um, we are, have been working in the, the field of education for a number of years, months, weeks, um, so now let's think as educators, think about um, what are some of the skills we think that is required to negotiate the higher education journey. So think about the ideal university student. What is it that we look for and what does university provide for them for them to negotiate this university journey? So maybe on the chat, just type in some key words, some key ideas, some things that come to mind. What are the key characteristics, the backgrounds of the ideal student? I'm, I'm just reading some of them out. Ambition, critical thinking, being open, being engaged, being committed. Um, absolutely 
I agree. Um, some of the other um, some of the other givens I argue that 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 is embedded within all of our students is the fact that they've come to university so that there's a degree of intelligence they're already. Um, there's there's a degree of curiosity. They want to find out more about the world, about, about themselves. You need discipline to be at university. Um, you need to work incredibly hard as well. These are these are the givens. I say, um, I argue that many of our students bring with them to university. Um, more comments, tolerance, perseverance, understanding. These are all valuable um, comments, and I agree with all of them. I asked this same question to many of our BAME students. I, I got them in a group and I, and I had a really interesting, insightful conversation. And this is what they told me. Hopefully, here we go. They, they argued that um, uh, the ideal student needs relative financial stability. They argued that the student at university needs to be flexible that they need access to networks of critical friends. It's a really interesting one. Um, many of them argue, um, told me, look, when I write an essay, um, I've got no one who's gonna read it and give me feedback. No one there who's gonna pull me up and give me honest feedback and say, ah, this, is, this doesn't make sense. Maybe you can put this here. This term doesn't quite make sense. The grammar here is wrong. This bit needs, needs a bit more referencing. Um, so this access to a network of critical friends, it could be a friend, a neighbor, a parent, a sibling, anyone, but many of the many of these young people are lacking such a network. They also argue that you need literate, maybe, and and some of them use the term professional parents, parents who give, who give, uh, and are also invested in their in their child's education. A parent that can perhaps um, read some of that work and give them some feedback there and then. This is a really interesting one. They argue that you need access to stationery and digital equipment, Wi-Fi, and homework space perhaps even more apparent in the last couple of years when online learning has become a day-to-day -day reality for many of us. They, they said you need the confidence to ask questions, the confidence to put your hands up in a, in a, in a lecture hall full of 100 students and say, um, Amino, I disagree with what you've just said, right? That takes a degree of confidence, a, a, a habitus, as Pierre Bourdieu would argue, to challenge the academic there in front of everybody. Knowledge of the university system, right? I've never been to university. I don't know anyone who's been to university. I don't have a cousin, a brother, a friend who's been to university. I don't know how it's going to be like, right? So they've come in fresh and they're finding out on their feet. And by the time they negotiate um, the university system, it's time to graduate. It's gone. It's finished, right? So they don't have that insight or that, that, that knowledge beforehand. Ability to read critically. I know some of you have put this in the, in the chat forum. Um, there's reading and there's critical reading, and we know critical reading is golden at university. So how do you critique the word? How do you disagree? How do you give examples? How do you develop arguments? This, this is so often alien to many of these students who have come to university getting excellent grades at college and A-levels, um, but mostly, and they argue, is um, that I've been taught how to pass exams. I've been taught how to pass exams, and I can do that really well. And now you're telling me, Aminor, to just get on with it, right? And that's where this, some of them are really struggling. This independent study skills and independent learning is something quite new to many of them. Career plans. Some, many of them are highly ambitious, highly disciplined, have got high aspirations, but they don't know how to get there. No one's told them. They don't have a network. They, they've gone to a career advisor at school who gave them some wishy-washy, airy-fairy advice, um, but that was it. It was just a tick box exercise. They still don't know how to get there. Time, time is a commodity. They, they, and lots of them said this. They said, I'm always in a rush. I don't have time to hang out after the lectures or a seminar because I've always got something else to do. A cultural responsibility, a community responsibility, a volunteering, a, a part-time job. I've got to take my dad to the doctors and my grandparents to um, her weekly uh, appointment at the GP. Um, there's always something that these students are doing and they're involved in it. And, they, and one of them used the term, and I just feel tired all the time. I'm exhausted. And these are 18, 19, 20 year old students. Not having to work, they argued. Look, I don't want to work. I want to be at university and I just want to study. But I have to work because I've got to help with the family finances. I've got to pay for my mobile bills, which was, which was a big consideration, um, especially for the, the younger um, TikTok generation. Um, and also I need to pay for my travel, right? Th these things are expensive, so I need to have a part-time job. And they also argued, and this is when they started comparing themselves with some of their more middle-class um, 
colleagues in the lecture halls, in their, in their seminar rooms, and they say, often I feel a bit inadequate because um, such and such has gone to Cuba for a year or such and such has gone, they go to Thailand with their family over the summer. Um, the best me and my family can do is maybe a trip to the south, south coast for a day trip. Um, so I sometimes feel as if I've got nothing to offer. I've not traveled enough. I'm not worldly enough. My voice perhaps is not as important as, as the person over there. And these are really interesting, insightful conversations you are having. Everything I've mentioned here, we as academics, we can see it happening in the lecture halls and in our seminar rooms, right? And it's really interesting to hear about these issues from the students themselves. I want you all, if I may, if you may, sorry, um, to just spend a couple of minutes to read this case study from a student of ours. Um, she's given me permission to share this. I've paraphrased um, the story. Um, I've anonymized her identity. Um, and if you can just spend a minute or two just digest reading this and digesting it yourself. Right, so there's a lot going on there. Um, I, I really like, the, well, I don't like the term, but the, the, the term multitasking has become part of my identity struck me um, when she was talking to me and I was making these notes. Um, but now put yourself in the shoes of Fatima here, right? And think of university life and think about some of the barriers, challenges, and, and perhaps even opportunities that you can identify from Fatima's story. And once again, use the chat forum and, and insert some, some thoughts and words. Um, what, what do you think are some of the barriers and challenges that Fatima or does experience on a daily basis in trying to balance all of these things as well as her university um, studies? So I can go back to the story, you can, you, you can read it again. Yes, and I'm, I'm just reading access to tech, absolutely, caring responsibilities. There's an invisible group cohort of young carers in this country um, across the globe, I, I argue, but especially in Western Europe, we're seeing it more and more now. Um, and they, their voices are often neglected and not heard. Um, and they, do, they spend so much time and energy without any form of complaint because they see it as their duty and their responsibility um, for looking after parents, looking after younger siblings, contributing to the family economy, we're talking 16, 17, 18, and 19 year olds. Um, yep, privacy, overcrowding, time for self-care, um, no time for social interaction with fellow students. Um, the opportunities, absolutely. Um, she's multilingual, the rich cultural background, the knowledge of real life. Imagine we as educators can, if we can articulate some of that into our pedagogy, right? If we knew that all of this stuff was going on with our students. If we knew, for example, that Fatima wakes up 6.30 in the morning and takes her siblings to school. So by the time she comes to university, she perhaps is, is exhausted already. Um, so the, the, the wisdom of starting 9 a.m. lectures for students like Fatima or even parents who have to drop their children off um, and may not be able to make a 9 a.m. Uh, lecture or a seminar, for me, is just absolutely bananas. Um, you, you just So this is one of the things that we've started to do in our module. So 10 o'clock is the earliest that we start. And we try not to put seminars during the three to four o'clock period as well, because we know school run 
is quite a complex, tricky situation for many of our student parents and also students who've got sibling responsibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Some of Fatima's great assets are and so undervalued in the in the university system. You can you can also see um, you can also see the fact that um, she talks about the, the fact that her parents are super supportive, but they don't have the literacy skills to, to support her to, to read and give critical feedback. You can see that she's working during the weekend. You can see um, that she's she she really enjoys and values her Islamic education. So she goes to on her online classes every single day. And you see her busy schedule, and, and often you think, where does she, where, the, where is she going to get the time to study amidst all of this? Um, and you can also see that um, her caring responsibilities towards her siblings and her grandparents, um, and these are great assets, I, I, I would argue. But often we as educators are completely oblivious to the lived experiences of many of our students. Now, Fatima is quite, I would argue, quite typical of many of our students. Um, and lots of them are amazing students who keep this life hidden. And it's mainly because nobody ever asked them. Nobody shows an interest about their life outside of the seminar room or the lecture halls. Okay. So that these intersectional lived experiences of many students from BAME backgrounds um, have also been have also been discussed and researched um, from, a, from an academic research empirical level. And much of the research alludes to the fact that these students also happen to come from um, low social um, economic backgrounds. Um, and the wider empirical research also highlights that many of these students experience, um, they've got cultural barriers to higher education, they've got employment commitments, they've got caring responsibilities, um, there's a general apathy, a disconnect towards who they are and university higher education and some of them have low aspirations as to they think they cannot achieve even though Fatima wants to go into teaching she doesn't quite know how to get there and also the the last point here which is a really interesting and a developing and an important one is that many of these students also come from Islamic Muslim backgrounds and there has been much research to show that there are many institutional Islamophobic barriers that also prohibit um, these students from really excelling in higher education. Just the, the last couple of slides, and I'm going to whiz through these very quickly because I'm conscious of time. Um, these issues that I've highlighted and discussed um, that many of our students have experienced has been exacerbated in the last um, two years through the COVID situation. Disproportionately, the, the South Asian, especially the Bangladeshi community, has been hit hard by COVID-19. The fatality rates amongst my community is, is beyond belief. And, and many of us are still trying to figure out why this is the case. The evidence is, evidence is showing that the intergenerational household, the overcrowded housing, the digital poverty, the caring responsibilities, this duty and responsibility towards the community and the family, that many of the people from the Bangladeshi community work in the service sector, employment, cab drivers, in retail shops, in grocery stores, delivery drivers, Many of them are too nice and compliant. They don't, they don't disagree with their bosses. They just do the shift that, they asked to, that they're asked to do. There's also a mistrust in the health system because of historical institutionalized discrimination within this. So they don't feel as if they, their, their voice is valued. So they don't go to the GP and say, look, I've got this pain or I've got this, this ailment that I'm worried about because they, they, they've been dismissed historically. Um, underlying health issues is also been something that's re-emerged. And I think something which is really important and not spoken about much within the South Asian community, the, the detrimental effect on the mental health of many young people in particular who have been homebound over the last two years um, and also experiencing many of these multi um, deprivational indices. The final slide, I just wanted to quickly just touch upon what we're doing at Goldsmiths. Um, we're mindful of all these. We're also mindful that we don't have the answers and solutions to all of these. Um, issues, but with, within our own meet, within our own departmental constraints, and and the, the will is there. We've got an incredible um, group of colleagues um, who are all have bought into this um, culturally responsive uh, pedagogy. Um, we've we've implemented this as part of a three year plan. We're also uh, acutely aware that the statistics show that our BAME students are not doing as well as their other student counterparts. So we're trying to figure out why, why this is the case. 
Um, so as a result, we've, we've set up, or we're about to set up a subcommittee that's gonna look into this. We really value our student voice. We want them to be embedded in what we do. Um, we want to implement study and reading circles. We wanna make this almost like a mandatory part of, of, um, of the university experience to encourage critical reading. Now, these reading circles could be virtual, they could be physical, they could be in a coffee shop. Um, we wanna do more outreach work with schools and community groups, because we understand that by the time they come to universities, perhaps even too late, we wanna intervene early and, and give them a taste of what university life could be like. Um, inclusive teachings, we want our lectures and readings and our, and our discourses and discussions to, be, to reflect our students' identities and their backgrounds. We want to um, listen to their stories. That's something that we really highly value. We want, we want to hear about the issues from them. Um, our staff training is really important, especially the role of the, the personal tutor, we argue. Mentoring is something that we're about to start. So some of our ex-students who have left the university from our department, we want to bring some of them back in and we want to mentor them, match them with some of our existing students and for, so they can just have a discussion, an informal discussion away from boring academics such as myself. Um, the assessment is also important. Um, should, are we going to go away from the traditional essay-based assessment to more verbal, more visual, more presentational styles that could suit a, a diverse student body? And also finance, we realize, is a big sticking factor for many of our students. So we wanna make them more aware of scholarships and opportunities out there for them to get financial assistance and guidance. Right, I'm aware that my time's up. Um, it's a debate. I've opened up many areas for discussion. Hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss them very soon. Um, here are my details. Please do stay in touch. Um, tweet me, email me, and we can continue this discussion. But now I guess I need to pass it on to now to Amira and Fidila for, the, for them to give their own insight into how it is to be a student at Trinity. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Aminol. Um, that was extremely engaging, giving us lots of food for thought. There's lots of parallels with our own students. Um, it's great to hear that in the project, we're kind of along the right tracks as well. We're, we're doing many of the things that you're doing, but there's also um, some additional things there that would definitely give us um, some food for thought. So thank you so much um, for being so engaging and for bringing that real lived experience and the voice of these students um, here today. It's been, it's been very powerful. So I am now um, going to hand over to um, Amira. Amira is a student in the School of Nursing and Midwifery. She's a member of the Trinity Student Muslim Society and a member of the Trinity Inc. Student Partner Committee on our project. As part of our summer student programme, she created a Trinity Inc. podcast on the experience of being a black Muslim student in Trinity, um, together with fellow students Zainab and Karim. She also contributed to a conversation for the International Day for Equal Opportunities in 2021 with Asya Hamdani in the Department of French in college. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Amira now. Thank you so much for joining us, Amira. It's, it's great to, to bring all this now to the, um, to the Trinity context. Thank you, no, Amira. Thank you so much for having me. And I also want to say thank you to Amino for his presentation as well, because it was really informative from a student perspective as well, hearing that academics are even interested in this area and see it as vital um, within our curriculum. So today I'm just going to discuss very briefly, because I only have five minutes, um, three things I feel are done well by the teaching staff in Trinity and three things I feel may need some improving as well. So I'm going to start off on a positive note. So firstly, I've noticed from a lot of my lectures that um, the effort is being made to extract learning from the experiences of students and related to the curriculum. And one way that that is done, um, especially in the School of Nursing, is through the use of scenarios. And even um, in Amno's talk as well, he presented a scenario to us so that we could understand the perspectives of people who are completely different. So, um, for example, um, in some of my lectures, when the scenarios are being used, I've noticed that um, uh, the typical Irish names, such as like Mary and Anne, are being switched um, to um, are being switched and 
basically culturally um, diverse names are being used instead. And I find that really valuable because it is more inclusive. It means that um, uh, individuals from different backgrounds who are completely different from um, Irish people and may not have their names as well are being included. So I feel, I, I find that really valuable. Um, and I also feel like in these scenarios that are being used by our lectures as well, um, they are including life situations that are different to what we kind of assume that every student is experiencing. And as well, they're also including um, problems that people from diverse backgrounds may be um, experiencing as well in these scenarios. Um, just like Amino kind of presented to us as well today. So I find that really valuable as a student. And that kind of goes on to my next point of lecturers are more eager and curious to initiate dialogue with students um, with the aim of kind of understanding their circumstances as well. And I've noticed that um, like our lecturers are trying to have more conversations with us and kind of throwing um, questions out within the classroom and kind of hoping that the students would engage with them so that they can also learn and students can learn. So I've kind of see, seen a development of the, the lecture student relationship in the classroom and hence like students are feeling more comfortable to kind of like um, express their own experiences um, to everyone. So. And then the last uh, point I have is that um, all of this, both the um, extraction of learning from student experiences and the dialogue kind of um, results in um, the empowerment of people from marginalized groups. So um, especially for within the um, within the mature student cohort, I've noticed that because um, they see all of these improvements being made in teaching, they are more likely to kind of um, recommend Trinity to their friends and family because they are seeing that their problems are seen as real and valued um, within our university and are hence going to um, recommend this university to people in their lives as well. So I'm now going to move on to things that I feel the teaching staff in Trinity could improve on. Um, the first thing um, I feel like could be improved is that lectures can be a little bit more um, careful and just be more sensitive with the jokes that they make in lectures and um, for the for the reason that it may not resonate with all students and can sometimes be deemed as offensive or inappropriate so i kind of just liken this towards um you know the irish assumption when you're abroad and you're on holidays um that Irish people are heavy drinkers and they love drinking. So if you have that, those preconceived ideas, people don't like that being placed on them. So it's kind of the same thing of when you make a joke in a classroom and um, it's obviously very harmless, but it doesn't resonate with some students as well. So um, I think caution should be put towards those uh, sort of jokes. Um, another thing, um, I feel could be improved is kind of avoiding the assumption that because we all live in Ireland, we have similar or the same experiences. Um, we all have different um, upbringings, values, and even life experiences, even if we were born here. And I think that needs to just be taken into consideration within the classroom as well. And finally, I think there could be an increase in the academic references that are being made. So whether these, um, this is resources or examples that are given to students so that um, there's more representation within our curriculum and make, and I think it should also be made a requirement um, for all students to kind of learn about um, the importance of being culturally sensitive and no, um, kind of just knowing that everyone is not going to have the same experience. And um, and back on like the academic resources I could and um, think could be provided. I think that when it comes to like especially in the school of nursing, um, I feel like more reference could be made to um, representation of let's say illnesses or diseases or depiction of. Um, an ill person, I think more representation could be done for um, people of color, people from diverse backgrounds, because if you think of it, the world is like globalization is gonna continue to happen. Um, we're, there's gonna be more immigration, more just moving around to different countries. So hence Ireland is gonna be like more of a diverse um, society. So our curriculum needs to reflect that. So that's kind of all of what I have today. Um, Thank you. thank you so thank you so much Amira some amazing points there um, for us all to take on board um, very clearly articulated thank you 
Um, and thank you so much for all the work you're doing on our student partner program as well. Without you guys, this this whole project wouldn't you know wouldn't be running. So um, thank you so much for that. So now I'm going to introduce Fadila Salawu. She's a third year law student and a member also of the Trinity Inc. Um, uh, student Partner Committee. She's a writer. She's a public speaker. She's explored themes of cultural appreciation, acceptance, and belonging as a young person on podcasts such as RTE's uh, Leap of Faith program, and excuse my Irish um, pronunciation here, the Mother Fuck Club podcast, as well as through writing on her personal blog. blog. So we're looking forward to hearing from um, Fadila. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, firstly, I must apologize. I don't have an eye-catching presentation like Aminul and Amira. Um, so please bear with me and uh, I hope to be as engaging as possible, but it's a, it's a hard act to follow with the, the great presentations that just went before me. Um, so firstly, again, thank you so much for, for having me and um, also for allowing me to follow on from those brilliant presentations. And I'm just gonna share a few of my observations from within the Trinity context. Um, I think firstly, this conversation in the first place is incredibly crucial in a university setting because I have very strong opinions and many people do. These opinions are actually based on um, certain theories, but like the idea of a university is a space where critical learning is supposed to be taking place, experience sharing is supposed to be taking place, we're supposed to be preparing to be educated citizens. And as um, the educational theorist Paolo Freire once said, it's not only about reading the word uh, academically, but it's also about reading the world um, in terms of culture and many other things. So um, when it comes to culture itself and culture within the classroom, my, my personal experience is I, I either see one of two things happening. The first is that there's this assumption of a neutral or generic culture that exists. So lecturers may make references to shared experiences that we assume are shared or cultural references that we assume apply to everyone. This is obviously not the case. The second um, experience that may happen is kind of a hush-hush way of addressing it, pretending it doesn't exist, that we are cultureless, backgroundless people and we only exist within the classroom, which also is not true and not applicable. So both of these two methods, they really just weaken the quality of teaching and learning. And every time that they, you know, you kind of do see them, either way, I mean, personally or people, you know, from minority backgrounds don't see themselves within it. Um, because obviously we do have cultures and obviously they are relevant, you know, they follow us wherever we go. And obviously not everyone has the same experiences and not everyone has the same culture. So I think as a, as a law student, the question of do we know our students that Aminul posed made me think, do we, do we want to know our students? I, I often find myself asking that from the kind of lecturer side, like wondering if a lecturer has an interest in, you know, who is sitting before them every day in a classroom. So I think for an example that came to mind was uh, in foundations of law, for example, as law students were taught to quite, to engage quite critically with ideas of morality and justice. So when we, um, an example of this is we, we're often faced with cases of, you know, what's right and wrong. And a case that is very, it's almost like, um, the, the classic case that every law student in Trinity knows in Foundations of Law is uh, a case being posed uh, in northern Nigeria. Um, and it's a case of um, a woman getting pregnant out of wedlock and the certain how the justice system is going to deal with her there. And it's a Muslim African context. And of course, I, a Muslim African student in the classroom, you know, relate to it in a rather personal way. Um, but you know, even in that scenario, we find questions of us and them. So how would this be dealt with, dealt with in our legal system? How is this being dealt with in their legal system? And, you know, even that classification of us and them, for it's becoming more and more redundant. Firstly, because, you know, uh, on, on a personal level with by people in the classroom, there are people who sit between us and them like myself for example you know i'm living within an irish context but i do come from an african muslim background um and then even in a globalized setting more and more students are having life experiences family experiences friendship experiences that are more global and they find themselves connecting you know 
more and more to a global identity, which allows them to appreciate more. So use of even the words us and them or judging culture, judging values, judging, you know, different systems in that sense often leaves a lot of people kind of left falling through the gap or, you know, sitting in the middle. Um, I find also in uh, thinking of Trinity in particular, I think that it's very important that we have these conversations because it is an incredibly international university, I believe it's the 17th most international in the world. And of course, in general, you know, Trinity is trying to, you know, lead the way in terms of um, cult, um, culturally sensitive practice and diverse practice and such. So, you know, these kind of things are what we really need to consider. You know, they may seem, uh, you know, a small scale. Not everyone is a law student, not everyone is a nursing student, but if we can all, you know, identify these common themes that, you know, there's clearly something that we need to consider a little more closely. Um, but on a more positive note, I found personally that spaces led by students for students tend to take in a lot more consideration and maybe are a good way to learn best practice. So I found by like my own personal experience, I've taken part I've taken part in the European Youth Parliament at various sessions. And um, you know, this is a, an organization completely led by young people. And we, you know, the emphasis that we place on sharing experiences, especially in a European context as well. And one example that comes to mind is we ran a series of TED Talks while I was a delegate at a session. And, you know, it was literally an opportunity for anyone and everyone to just come up and talk about something that they were passionate about. Um, you know, we had some people come up and talk about Star Wars, and we also had some people come up and talk about bullying or talking about their experiences as, you know, being a traveler. And I found it just so telling that naturally, these are the kind of conversations that when given the opportunity to, people automatically wanted to share with people, just wished people would know more about, just, you know, the, even the concept of a TED talk, we know it's like the most passionate thing you're, you know, the thing you're most passionate about. So that was that was really telling for me. I also found find that in Trinity, you know, we have a really big emphasis on student societies, and even within those spaces, again, led by students for students, there's a really really great opportunity where you can really see students being themselves and sharing in different ways. And a lot of these societies do have an educational element and do have cultural elements, and it is a really good, you know opportunity for learning and I say this as someone who's benefited a lot from this myself um, so I think that from there there's a lot that we could learn about even the consideration students have for fellow students but perhaps an academic system um, that hasn't quite caught up with you know these considerations and again um, it reminds me of Paolo Freire's um, considerations on what it means to be a teacher student and a student teacher so everyone's learning from everyone and you know we're constantly appreciating that there's more to learn outside you know the textbook curriculum um, and yeah just to conclude I think that you know, Ireland is feeling, is starting to feel a growing acceptance for cultural diversity. I see this a lot in the art scene as a writer myself, and it's very heartening. And I also see, you know, even growing up passing through primary and secondary school, like the growing consideration for diverse families, for diverse ethnicities and such, you know, it's happening, you know, it just uh, perhaps needs to have happen a little faster. There's a lot more to consider. And of course we're learning, you know, step by step. So we know that it's possible to know. We, we've seen that we want to know, but it's the question, you know, of how we do it, you know, really just putting that and putting students at the heart of the learning experience, I think is really what needs to happen. Thank you so much, that's, that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fadila. Um, that was amazing. I mean, we're just so lucky to have our two student partners who are here. And we've actually, there are other student partners who have joined us here as well. And the work they do is obviously central to our project. So thank you so much for articulating that so well. We can certainly um, look forward to seeing both of you, I would imagine, in some kind of public life role in the future, I hope. Um, so I'd just like to, in the last, and I know Amin has put a lovely um, a comment in there, in, in, in the text boxes, in the chat box as well. So I've, we've just got nine minutes left, um, so I'd like to open the floor now to any questions that anybody might have for our three panellists. Nora. I'll turn off mute. 
Um, just very, very much thank you to the three of you. And uh, sorry, I was a uh, video off. I was trying to eat lunch at the same time. And I'm, um, I'm going to be the inclusive curriculum champion in the business school. And I wonder, do you have any thoughts or kind of you might say, yes, there's a huge literature on this, but I'm listening to the first presentation and the kind of obstacles that um, the student in the case study faces and, um, and to the context of her life and you know like her say you know her father is a taxi driver and her you know her um you know uh, we have students who um you know come from medical backgrounds and from law backgrounds and a part of me is yes absolutely we need to um increase um as much as we can the access um, but do any of you kind of, is there a literature on kind of how the curriculum itself is so alienating for people who um, who uh, come to uh, come into the university? So just take, for example, you know, someone whose father is a taxi driver or works in a service industry like um, the local news agents. And then, you know, in the business school, you know, we teach a HRM or human resource management of performance matrices and how to, you know, uh, create contracts that will extract uh, more flexibility from the same people. Um, or, you know, in uh, the, the law school, you know, um, everything we do is so correct and everything, but how come then we have a legal system with such inequality in it or a medical system with such inequality in it? It can't be kind of, um, it can't be coincidental, do you know? So I like I, I think you know increasing the access is so important. But then, like part of the kind of the change has to happen internally with the educators themselves that that we are able to re-educate ourselves on what the curriculum is in the first place, that it doesn't kind of just make those people um, come into classrooms and be educated in a way that further alienates them. Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, can I can I come in then, Nora? F thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I, I think that the wider challenge for and and I put myself in this in this same boat as well as an educator is the wider challenge is how do we how can we make our whole student body feel valued and included within within the classrooms, the lecture halls, within the ethos of the university. Um, I think I've, I put this comment down, and this has got to come from us, right? We need to make them feel valued all students not just students from BAME background all of our students that yeah. their lives their identities their heritages their cultures their languages matters and the challenge is how do we do that there are lots of things that we can do they don't all necessarily work um, some of the practical stuff that I've started to do for example in the lecture halls I find that many of us BAME students go to the back of the lecture halls and they drown right they don't want no one to see them and then whenever you ask a question, they just, one of them just tentatively puts their hands up. So I start the, I've started the deliberate process of getting them to come and sit at the front. I've had a conversation with them outside of the classroom environment. And I say things to them is, such as, you've got such great things to say, why don't you say it? Mm. Right? And, and then she said to me afterwards, she said, no one's ever said that to me, Emily. And I said, why not? I said, because nobody's ever said that to me. So I gave her just that little injection of confidence and now she can't put her hands down. She, it's always up and she sits at the front. So it's just it's just just practical things like this, just being a bit more acute and a bit more aware of your surroundings, looking at the dynamics of the classroom, the seminars, the little clicks that form that certain students stick to themselves, doing group work where they encourage to mix with each other. They start their own social media groups and I encourage them to um, go, go with people that they don't necessarily feel comfortable with all the time. So I encourage it. I don't force it. I don't dictate it. It's an encouragement. And it's it, so, but the key thing underlying all of that is they need to feel as if they've got something important to say. So I, I get them to watch movies from, from Africa, from Asia, get literature from other parts of the world. I, I get literature that, that discusses things that are relevant to them. So it doesn't only value them, but some of their white European counterparts also get to know more about their culture. The, the culture of their friends. Because um, many of their white um, colleagues don't even know the Fatima story. 
So they don't know that Fatima was woken up at 6.30 in the morning, taking her brothers and sisters to school, comes back at 3.30 3 because she's got to do the school run and then look after her disabled mum because Fatima feels uncomfortable sharing that. But once they know, their colleagues absolutely embrace it. Their friends absolutely embrace it. So it's, it's encouraging that ethos of sharing and caring and feeling, making them feel valued. Thanks. Thanks a million, Aminal. Um, yes, I mean, we can all do those very small things in, 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 in lectures and seminars, can't we? So, um, you know, as we observe our students and, 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 and look at who's working with who and who's, who's being left out and who isn't talking, etc. So that, that's where the kind of after class and pre-class little conversations are so valuable, isn't it? Fadila, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I really appreciated that question, actually. I think, I mean, of course, I can only answer it from the student perspective, but I would say just that feeling that I've found in humanities, I've taken a couple of electives outside the law faculty as well, is that, you know, a lot of our stuff is very ideal. You know, we're focused on social ideals and like things are like this and it's equal in this way. And this regulation means that these people are protected or, you know, this group is valued and, you know, stuff like that. And we we as students sitting in the classroom know very obviously that this is not always actualized in real life. So I think this really small thing that I found that is really impactful for me personally and I, um, with also with my classmates that I've spoken with is even just that like recognition that, you know, we, we might mention a law or, you know, a certain institution that protects a certain group of people. And then just the lecturer making mention of like, but this law is falling short in this way, or, you know, there's this to be improved on it, or maybe we're not, just not painting the world as this completely ideal place where everyone is equal and everyone is protected and these things are, you know, all going perfectly smoothly. And that also, I found, is like a really great inspiration for students ourselves to feel like we can be part of, you know, mending the, the broken patches and, you know, these kind of things. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks very much, Fadila. Um, so, yeah, who's one of our school champions. Thanks. Very thanks, Rachel. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for that, Fadila. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, I'm, I'm trying to think about Nora's question, which I think is very important. And, you know, like, since I'm from the law school as well, and there, there is, of course, this problem of, as Fadila says, painting a world that's very ideal. I think this is true for any discipline that you know, maybe it's the demands of the profession, maybe it is the demands of getting across content to students that the ideal picture is presented and sort of that's communicated. I do think, but however, there is a, as they say, you know, there's a fissure, there's a crack in the mirror always. And when it comes to law, it would be, you know, the critical legal studies movement, which pretty much says that after you've described the law and how to implement it and enforce it, and then you say, but you know all this is nonsense because this is of a particular political perspective which has just been put across before you. So I guess, and, and I think we have to go a long way in the law school for this, but this is true for any discipline, that after the neutral or the ideal perspective is presented, in then the political perspective is presented as well. And that's, that would probably, give students a greater, let's say, window to, to actually contribute rather than sort of say, oh, okay, this is the ideal content which you need to engage with. Um, and you know, that is where our discussion ends. And I do think this is true for just about any discipline. We know the discursive movement in psychology, we know science and technology studies when it comes to the sciences. All of them you know, provide for, let's say, a more inclusive theoretical method to, to, to sort of promote greater engagement. So I wonder if we want to mainstream this theoretical method in our disciplines on a regular basis, whether that would provide for greater participation. Thank you very much. So yeah, there's, there's so many more conversations to be had, isn't there, aren't there? And as one of our school champions, um, we'll definitely explore this um, further with you. So I think um, we're, we're just past two o'clock. So it just remains for me to thank Aminal so much for joining us today and for opening up this debate and lots of very interesting discussion. I also want to thank um, Darina and Sean who've been behind the scenes, busily organizing and, and obviously uh, as well, Amira and Fadila. So thank you so much everybody and thank you for giving up your lunchtime to join us as well. And um, we might well have to get Aminal back because a, <laughs> an hour definitely wasn't enough. Um, and we hope to see you all as well to join us um, for our next um, session. So please do keep an eye on our um, website. Um, so thank you so much to everybody today and have a great weekend.